So uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Christina Donaldson. I've been at St. Andrews since I was a teenager. I came because of Randy and the youth program. More recent, oh, uh, then I raised three children here. I have three wonderful children. So more recently, I've been um, guiding and coordinating the stewardship team and the capital campaign team. So today is a presentation that I like to do once a year as we're leading up to our pledges for the annual budget. What we call the stewardship campaign raises money for the church's annual budget for the upcoming year for 2021. So as a part of that gaining momentum for that campaign, we want to give you some perspective on what we've done this year and what our hopes are for next year. So today's presentation will be a, a combination of different teams that are involved in the business side of the church, the, the ministry support side of the church. So we're going to have some speakers from the finance team, from the personal team, and from the pastor nominating committee. And I'm pleased to say I've just recruited a special guest, Pastor Donnie himself has agreed to give us just a few comments. So the first part of the meeting is from the finance team. They're going to give us a presentation, a PowerPoint about the money side. And uh, today we have Jason Schuhart. He's the treasurer, the coordinator of the finance team, and also a longtime member of St. Andrew. Thanks, Jason. Good morning. Uh, as Chris said, I'm Jason Schuhart. I'm treasurer currently. I joined the finance team 2001 and have been on it ever since. Uh, and, and so obviously enjoy being part of this and uh, sharing some updates with you today. Um, the finance team itself is made up of the individuals listed here. I love the team. I love the people that are on it. Uh, the teams in the past have been terrific as well. We've got uh, Michelle DeGroote as assistant treasurer now. Uh, Aaron Gibson was former uh, assistant treasurer has remained on the team. We've got four past treasurers besides myself on the team. So as, as John Benson likes to say, we have a lot of institutional knowledge uh, represented here and, uh, and I'm, I'm proud to be part and, and pleased to be part of this team. And if any of these people, you see them and you have any questions, they, they will always be helpful and uh, I encourage you to talk to them. Um, the finance team role, I think is, there's differing uh, opinions on what the role of the team is. I wrote down some items here, but in, in summary, the number one finance team counts things, right? We count what's going out, we count what's coming in, we count what we owe, and we count what we have. And then we report on that. We report to ourselves, we report to session, and we report congregation periodically like this. Um, then we also predict. So we'll look at past performance of income or expenses, and we will, uh, the sound okay? Oh, good. So, um, and we will make predictions for upcoming years, uh, for the upcoming year as to what we think the income is that's attainable is and what uh, is a responsible amount of expenditures to make. Uh, and finally, we advise. Uh, we've, we provide advice to teams, to staff members, to session. But the thing we don't do is we're, we're not the final say. We, we don't approve or decline things. We simply report and advise and the decisions are made ultimately by session or in the case of borrowing uh, money, that's a congregational thing or tap pastor terms of call is also a congregationally approved thing. Um, so that's what the finance team is and is not. Uh, I want to speak to two areas today. One is what we call the general fund, and that's what we use to run the church every year. So calendar year 2020, uh, we have a budget. We had a stewardship campaign last year and pledge cards, and we predicted and we came up with a budget. And, uh, and that's what the general fund is that I'll speak to first. <clears throat> so let's look at what happened in 2019 and compare it to what we expected to happen in 2020. 2019 was a really good year. We brought in $933,000 of income and only spent 882. So we actually ended up the year to the positive by $50,000. So when we went and analyzed and, and adopted a budget for 2020, we 
decided that we could attain a slight growth in income over what actually happened in 2019. And we could also spend those dollars that would be coming in, which means we would be increasing income by about 3% and increasing expenses by about 9% over what actually happened because we underspent what we thought would happen in 2019. So then 2020 happened. Uh, and at this point through the year, we would have expected to have brought in 720,000 and spent 720,000. But what has actually happened to this point through September, which is the most recently complete month, is that we brought in 636,000 and we spent 638 which means we're $2,000 behind in terms of expenses over income for the year, but that's less than 1%. So essentially we are break even to this point through the year. We're just, we just have brought in less and spent less than we expected to. And if we look at how this year compares to last year at this time, at this point last year, we brought in 695,000. This year we brought in 636. So we're $58,000 behind. Well, that's eight and a half percent. So this year's giving is eight and a half percent behind last year's giving. And given the pandemic, uh, you know, if we were a restaurant and the accountant showed up and said, hey, you're break even and you're only eight and a half percent behind last year, I think you would be ecstatic. And, and so we are covering our bills with the income that is being generously provided by everyone, even with the changes in financial situations that obviously people in the congregation have had. And we're, only, we're less than 10% off of last year's pace. Um, so I find these numbers very encouraging given all that has happened uh, in the last six months or so. As the finance team, we tried just to look at, is there any one glaring explanation where we fell off a cliff or that explains why income is down. And first we looked at two normal years, 2019 and 2018, and looked at how mon money came in month over month. And 2019 was a better year than 2018, but it's still some of the months, I believe four of them were less income than their corresponding uh, 2018 months. So there really isn't a, a hard and fast pattern here. And if you do the same thing for 2020 versus 2019 through the first nine months, 2020 is off eight and a half percent compared to last year, yet January and May, and May is right in the middle of the pandemic setting in, 2020 was better in January and May for income than it was in 2019. My point of all this is that I don't believe we identified any particular pattern. It's just a combination of, of effects that explain the eight and a half percent drop in, in income and, uh, and the corresponding drop uh, in expenses. The last thing that's different about 2020 that some of you have, I'm sure, heard about in headlines and read about the payroll protection program. Um, when March set in, the finance team talked and you know, we didn't have any true idea what was gonna happen, you know, how much giving might change. Uh, and this program was set up as part of the overall stimulus package with the idea that businesses could take out a loan and use that money to pay their staff and pay their mortgage or their rent and pay their electric bill and keep all the people employed, even if they weren't able to stay open for business. So like a restaurant that might not actually be open, uh, they could at least keep paying their staff for two months. The idea being that that staff could then turn around and pay their own rent and their own car payment or, or insurance and groceries, et cetera. And so not knowing what was gonna happen, we applied for and got one of these loans. And John Benson did a kind of a heroic amount of paperwork to get this done. And, and Pam Passmore at Two Rivers Bank was, was very instrumental in this as well. This is not 94,000 of income. This is a loan. We received 94,000, we deposited it in the checking account, and then we followed the rules. We used it in April and May, and we paid our staff, that all of which we retained. We paid our electric bill, we paid our, our uh, mortgage uh, interest payments. And at this point, we still owe the $94,000 back because it's only now that the ability to apply for this loan to be forgiven is available to us. So we're going through that process right now. Again, John is, is handling a ton of paperwork. Um, and we expect this loan to be forgiven. It 
hopefully by the end of the year, but they're, it's the government and uh, you know, we'll, we'll figure out that timing. But it's important to remember that we did this because we were facing uncertainty. In hindsight, six months later, it turns out that all the giving that did happen was sufficient to cover all the expenses that did happen. So we ended up not needing this money, but we still spent it following the rules so that it can be forgiven. When it is forgiven, we would have somewhat of a, you know, 90 some thousand dollar uh, amount of cash available that if everything else was working out perfectly, we could look at what, what uses that money might, uh, might be used for. We're not there yet. It's a good problem to have, uh, but I did want to mention that we did in fact receive and expect to have forgiven uh, a payroll protection loan this year. Okay, so the other side of the fence is the building and the loan that we have against it. Um, actually, I should stop there. Is there any questions that I'm not seeing that I should speak to right now? Okay, we'll, we'll move on to the mortgage. Um, so. We moved in, uh, I think just prior to January, 2017, the loans officially started uh, essentially in January, 2017. And we started out with two loans that totaled 5.1 million. Uh, it would have been 5.8 million, but we'd already sold the land next door that the condo apartments are built on. And, and that money of 685,000 was used to pay down the loan. So our loans started life at 5.1 million in the beginning of 2017. So then 2017, 2018, 2019 happened, and we were able to pay off one of the loans completely and get the other loan down to 4.5. So our 5.1 uh, became 4.5 over the course of three years. Um, and I had to actually double check this because it feels like a million years ago, but February of this year is when we actually went outside and, and some of you were here to see us burn the, the mortgage note for the smaller of the two loans. Uh, so, we are at the, at the beginning of 2020, we had a $4.5 million uh, bank loan still. The original loan terms, uh, the first loans paid off. So I crossed that out. The second loan started life as a 4.125% loan. Um, together when we started and had both loans that required us to pay $30,000 a month, the minimum payment uh, to, to cover both of these loans. Um, the bigger loan, the building loan that's still in place is uh, set up to be paid over 25 years, but at the end of 10 years, it balloons. And that means that whatever we still owe, we'll have to go get a different loan and pay this loan off at whatever interest rate are available at that time, which could be lower or could be higher. Uh, but by allowing the bank to take less risk uh, on that interest rate being good for 25 years, we were able to get the 4.1% interest rate uh, as long as we agreed to refinance after 10 years. So with the one remaining loan, our main monthly minimum payment is not $30,000 anymore because one of the loans is paid off, it's about $25,000. During this year, and because we've had good fortune of paying uh, faster than we have had to pay on the, on the mortgage, the bank was able, and Pam Passmore was able to reduce our interest rate from 4.125 to 3.85%. And the rest of the terms stay the same. And so uh, we have about six more years, a little more than six years of regular monthly payments that because the interest rate has been reduced and because it's taken into account all the prepayments that we've already made, our minimum payment is now 23,000 a month, 23,220. Whereas we started life less than four years ago, owing $30,000 a month. Um, and those are all great things in terms of managing cash to not have, to reduce your monthly obligation. Uh, and, and that reduces our risk in, in running the church month over month and year over year. So the finance team has uh, kind of rules of thumb with regard to how much money we keep back in reserves uh, essentially for a rainy day. Uh, on the general fund or the operating side of things, our rule of thumb is that we always wanna keep two months worth of expenses in the checking account. And that way, if literally nobody gave anything for two months in a row, we could still pay every single 
uh, payroll and utility bill, et cetera, that we expect during those two months. And we'd have those two months to sort out and scramble and figure out what else we would need to do. That hasn't happened to us, but that's the reason that we keep the two months in reserve. The tweak on that this year is that we also received the PPP loan that I mentioned, which was $94,000. And so our, our tweak on our rule of thumb is that we wanna keep two months uh, in reserves plus enough money to pay back the PPP loan if for whatever reason it wasn't forgiven, we would have enough to just pay it off and act like basically it never happened. So that's a target of 254,000 uh, and we're at 240. So we're, we're definitely within striking distance of, of where we like to see cash levels remain to keep us safe in case uh, there are significant changes uh, in income. On the mortgage side and paying the, the bank loan, our rule of thumb is to keep six payments. So if all giving to the capital campaign dried up, we would still be able to pay the mortgage for six months and we'd have that amount of time to figure out what we're gonna do next. Um, and as such, and because of the pattern of giving uh, the, to the capital campaign not being regular monthly installments from every person who's giving, we often find that we have significantly more than six months uh, in reserve. And when that happens, and when we're still confident that the remaining money that will come in will be enough to make future payments on the mortgage, we are able to make prepayments on the mortgage and get our, our mortgage amount or principal reduced that much more. So during 2020, you know, I mentioned we started the year at a $4.5 million loan we were able to, because of generous and fast giving to the capital campaign, we were able to make a prepayment of $220,000 in June of this year. We also got the refinance or the interest rate update uh, dropping from 4.125 to 3.85%. That brings at the end of September, our loan balance to the number you see there, 4.157 million. In October, we did the arithmetic again and found we still had $30,000 more than we needed in the capital campaign building fund account. And we were able to make an additional $30,000 prepayment in addition to our regular payment. And so at the end of this month, our loan is gonna be about 4.1 million, $4,111,000. And we still have two payments in November and December to make this year, which should round it down to just about 4.1 uh, million exactly. Um, and the interest rate reduction on a loan of the size of 4.1 million, having this lower interest rate saves us $11,000 of interest per year. So to summarize both sides again, on the general fund, the giving is down 8.5%, but we're break even for the year, which is frankly incredible. Um, when we look to 2021 and what budget we're going to set and what income we're going to expect, it's really gonna depend on two things. First, how does 2020 end? And the other is this current stewardship drive that we're doing right now and what pledge cards get turned in and how those compare to pledging in prior years. Uh, so this is a very important time uh, from, from a planning uh, perspective. And then on the mortgage side, this year we were able to pay an additional quarter of a million dollars, $250,000 to the loan that we didn't have to pay but because of the generosity, we were able to pay, and that just reduces the amount of interest that we'll pay over time, uh, and obviously the amount that we still owe. Uh, we got the interest rate reduced, which will give continued interest rates, uh, interest payment savings moving forward. And through all of this, except for March and April, I believe, of this year, because finance team basically pulled back and said, let's spend as little as possible until we have a little certainty as we, we enter the pandemic. Every month that we've had the loans, we've paid 30,000. Now back in 2017, we had to, but as we've continued to pay down the loans and we paid one of the loans off, and now we've updated the interest rate and recalculated what our minimum monthly payment is of now 23,000. The fact that we continue to every month pay 30,000 means that in addition to all the lump sum prepayments that we've been able to make, we also are chipping away an additional about $7,000 a month against the, the balance that, that we are not required, but have proven to be able to do. Uh, and so that means in four years, we paid about a million dollars off of a $5.1 million loan. 
And if you know how loans work, the payments you make in the early years are almost all interest. So the fact that we paid almost 20% of a $5 million obligation off in the first four years of having the obligation is again, I think uh, a testament to, to the faithfulness and the generosity um, and the trust, frankly, of, of everybody in the congregation. So last slide, uh, what can you do? Some of you, last time I gave a similar uh, discussion, I you may remember I mentioned that two kind of lifelong family friends here in town independently, separately approached me and both told me, hey, I heard rumors that St. Andrew's in really bad shape, that, that finances are looking bad and that we're, you're not covering your mortgage and, and your building's too big. And, and so I told them what I told you today. And, and I said, hey, we're, we're not only just handling our mortgage, we're, we're you know, crushing it, frankly. And that if you put it in personal terms, we're in a building that, you know, call it roughly $12 million building. We owe 4 million against it still, uh, a little more than 4 million. But in round numbers, that's like going and buying a $300,000 house and putting $200,000 down, which everybody would love to be able to do. And so from a, a big picture financial perspective, I want everybody as part of the congregation to, to truly believe that we're doing well. We have more work to do, but we've proven that we can do it and we've proven that we can actually do it faster than we have to do it. Um, and so I encourage you, if you haven't already, participate in the giving to the general fund to operate the church each year, participate in the capital campaign. You can reach out to John Benson on either of those items if you haven't participated in the past. It just feels good to do, it's the right thing to do and it enables everything that, that we are doing uh, to happen and celebrate that and share it with others and, uh, and proceed with confidence even in the face of uh, the unknown that, that we all are facing at the moment. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Jason. It's uh, really a treat to hear your perspective, both in the finance meetings and on the platform today. I hope that you folks at home are uh, ready with your fingers in the chat box. Uh, we would love for there to be some dialogue. One of my, my favorite parts about stewardship is the conversation and the feedback that I get. And so in pandemic times, it's a lot harder to hear your perspectives and your opinions. If you have questions or you wanna make a comment, um, start now in the chat box and a little bit later in the presentation, if you want to speak and unmute yourself, I'll tell you when we're ready for that. So, okay, perfect. Yeah, that's a good idea. Oh boy, now it's all me. Good grief. So we're gonna transition to the comments from the personnel team and the pastor nominating committee. And in order to do that, I'm gonna have Pastor Donnie come up. He said that he would give a few words of his own perspective. From the stewardship team, uh, I always begin with thank you. You know, Jason, it's so exciting to hear the way Jason describes the numbers because He's steeped in the ministry of St. Andrew. He grew up at St. Andrew. He raised his kids at St. Andrew. He really cares about both the work that we do on site and the outreach work that we do. And so, um, you know, thank you for the ways that you're giving, for the ways that you give of your finances, but also for the ways that you give of your time. Uh, the church today was particularly lovely. We hope that as part of the presentation that you worshiped with us, right? The first thing that we do as a congregation is we worship together. And so we worshiped this morning and part of worship was um, the high schoolers leading us in the offertory with their praise band. A second thing that we saw in worship was a video from the neighborhood centers and how they're using our space for the hybrid kids for their non-school days. Um, when you think about the ways that St. Andrew has invested, when I talk about stewardship, I like to say thank you. And then I like to think about the way that we're investing our resources. 
you know, even in times of crisis, what an opportunity it has been to invest in worship. Uh, we've done a lot of growing this year in learning to do use technology to worship. We spent a lot of our personnel time and resources in figuring that out. Investing in on-site ministry. The Neighborhood Centers is just one example of partnerships that we have with the community. And uh, we have designated funds. If you haven't been over to the property lately, you'll see that we've been working on the playground. So we're investing in those outdoor spaces. And then um, I often like to get some comments from the MOS team because even in pandemic times, we've been investing in those uh, offsite partnerships, whether it's the community food pantry or the international um, missionaries that have been depending on us for many years. You know, we have been steadily fulfilling those uh, relationships and giving over and above. The people of St. Andrew gave more than $4,000 for the Guatemala mission and more than a thousand, you know, in the thousands plus personal time to help with the derecho in Cedar Rapids. So um, the, the numbers that Jason presents via PowerPoint, like they don't even touch the surface of the amount of generosity in our congregation. So thank you for that. So now if Donnie will come up, I'll trade spots with him. Donnie is one of the people that we really want to thank. He did a very brave thing. I don't know if he realized what a dangerous thing he was doing when he agreed to become the interim senior pastor, right? He stepped into this controversy about the size of our mortgage and um, there's just so many things that he stepped into that I don't know that he recognized what a brave thing that was to come to our congregation. So it's really been a joy to hear his perspective, um, his experience from South Africa, from being pastor at many different churches. And so I've invited him to just say a few words today. Chris, sometimes ignorance is bliss. Um, <laughs> but friends, I, I, I came here not knowing anything, didn't believe what the IPNC was to, uh, telling me. Um, and I discovered a group of people it was really amazing. I saw the church, but I realized that the church is nothing if there are not people in here. And this year it has been confirmed in many ways as we had to ask you not to come to worship, which is a strange experience. Always we, we beg you to come to worship and suddenly we had to tell you not to come to worship. And I realized more and more that what the biggest resource of St. Andrew really is the people, that in spite of not being able to come to worship, we continue to be a church. When people ask me, is the church closed? I said, no, the church can never close and St. Andrew is not closed. We continue to do ministry in many places and we continue to worship even though we worship online. I remember one Sunday where we didn't manage the technology really well and uh, <laughs> couldn't get the stream out which was kind of crazy what shall i do okay we good okay we good i don't understand te technology even today but i remember that one sunday when we couldn't stream and so many people were disappointed but one thing that i've heard over and over again during this time is appreciation for what the staff do uh, kyle uh, in many ways leading either uh, imagining some things that I'm sometimes afraid to ask her to think about new outreach projects, outreach ministries. Uh, Matthew with his music, even using music to reach out to people. Um, Randy reaching out to young people to disciple them. Uh, an amazing staff invested with the support staff. Uh, Jeff, um, who became our communications Consultant, didn't know a thing about it, I'm sure, but he discovered a lot of things as he go about and as you see in our streaming even today. Uh, so friends, a beautiful building, a big building, but this isn't a church. This is but um, an instrument, but a tool for us to do ministry. You are indeed the church and wherever you are, as you continue 
I discovered that thing about uniting arts and renewing lives really is true. Uh, as we continue with our new theme of inclining our hearts to God. It is the way that people live and the way that we do and the way that St. Andrew is known. Uh, Jason, not for not being able to pay our mortgage, but for all the big things we do, as you heard from neighborhood centers and as we uh, heard from so many people thanking us for being a church. So friends, uh, blessings. I will follow you like a bed lamp, not saying a thing, but seeing and hearing everything. Um, thank you so much for staying connected to St. Andrew, even during this time. And if you somehow fell off the wagon a little bit, just get back on. The church is open. The church is here. St. Andrew will be here into the future, as long as you, as people, as members of this church are here. Thank you for everything that you are doing and that you are continuing to do. Chris, even to you for the excitement you bring to this. Thanks. Then oh, we're just going to share the piece, right? One of the really fun things that we learned uh, last week in services was how to share the piece with sign language. And so we'll just take this opportunity to share the piece with Donnie. And in, that, in sign language, this is how you share the piece. With you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, you can say I'll stay with you. Okay, so let's take a pause um, about, is there anything in the chat box? Oh, can you hear me? Is there anything in the chat box? Um, yeah, thank you so much for all your positive comments. So now if Kathy Dice is there, are you with us, Kathy? Can you turn on your monitor and unmute yourself. Hello. Oh, good. Okay. Thank you, Kathy, for joining us. I give it to you. Uh, well, good morning. It's, uh, you know, I have four people on my screen. So good morning to you four and everyone else that's out there. Um, I, Chris uh, asked us to uh, talk a little bit about uh, where per personnel is at. She gave me uh, three points to uh, three points to talk about. So um, the first I want to do is I, I don't have a slideshow presentation, so I'll just tell you uh, who is on the personnel team. Uh, Wes Havley's on there, uh, Graham, uh, Demeron, Myrna, Myrna, I'm not going to say it right, Ferrara, uh, Lisa Schilling, uh, Bob Bowman, um, Pastor Donnie, and myself. So that's, that's our team. Um, and uh, this year has been one of just, just trying to uh, to maintain with the pandemic. Uh, look at all of the different areas of of what's what's happening with with the staff, with the building. Um, try and keep everybody kind of on a level key. Um, and uh, you know, we've had some some ups and downs uh, with that. You know, because we have some that. Um, on the team that you know felt real strongly about about lots of stuff with with the building and others of us that were like okay you know we, we need to we need to follow the lead of session so we've, we've kind of done that done that this year um, the other thing that we're really looking forward to is um, uh, meeting the new pastor and, and setting up with them um, uh, you know looking at our, our missional uh, program that we did with with Pastor Donnie and seeing how we can make all of the all the things happen with the staff we have if it was if it's a really good better year we we've got to get a new communications uh, person in there uh, Jeff has offered to do this for a couple months that was back in a year ago when Sarah left in November and he's still there uh, keeping us rocking and rolling and we are so appreciative of you Jeff um, Jeff, if I was there, I'd come over and give you a big hug, but I'm going to let Chris take care of that this afternoon for me, um, because we really do appreciate all you've done uh, in that position to keep us going. Um, we wouldn't be here this morning um, talking like this if it wasn't for, for you and in your persistence to keep us, keep us online and, and make, make us stay as a, as a church, church family. So the other other area that we're looking at in the next year is a, a, a part-time building management uh, position uh, to help us with all of the logistics of the building rentals and all, all that stuff. So 
um, we're kind of in a holding pattern at the moment, but we're we're heading forward. We're we're heading forward with all that. So, um, the pastor nominating team will let us know when we have to take action. Um, until then, we're we're just happy to support them in the session in any way we can. If you have any questions about anything, you can email me. My email is on our uh, in our directory, um, or you can send it to Jeff, and Jeff will get it to me. Uh, Chris, anything else? Yeah, again, uh, if you have questions, uh, put them in the chat box, right? We'd love to hear your input. And um, of course, you can send us personal emails, right? You can go to the church website and get the office administration. You know, we'd be happy to talk to you individually. But if you have something that you want us to address um, in the public setting here, please put it in the chat box. So now we're gonna to switch to either Aaron or Becca, who are gonna to talk to us about the pastor nominating committee. So Aaron, um, you jump in. And Chris, you said you had some questions, but I, I'll start off by just so I can hear myself. Um, say who's on our committee. It's, it's me, Aaron Shilney. Kathy Anderson, um, Sarah Penn, Dean Oaks, Thomas Hartley. Um, now I can't remember who I've already said. Uh, Mary Lou uh, Watkins, uh, Tim Patrick. Uh, did I say Wes Havley? No, Wes. Okay. Then that's it. Um, and we've been meeting. We started right when COVID started. So we've been meeting via Zoom to do everything. Um, and I have tried to uh, provide a couple of um, updates at various points. We've, we've gone through, um, the Presbytery has, a, it's called a CLC, which is Church Leadership Connection, uh, which is an online website program. You fill out your, um, your missional statement um, and submit it. And then pastors who are searching for a church go in and, and um, you, it's an electronic matching situation. So we have seen over 50 resumes for pastors through that um, and have done online Zoom conversations, have uh, looked at references for pastors um, that they have provided and um, are in what we are hoping is the final phase of um, having a, a few final candidates come into Iowa City and meet us in person. Um, however, being a final candidate and having a pastor is not the same thing. So we are hopeful, um, but until we sit down after these interviews are complete and decide as a group that one of these people is the right fit for St. Andrew, um, and then if we decide that there's the right fit, you go, uh, the presbytery has to do a final sign off and then the candidate themselves has to also believe that that's the, they are the right fit for us. Um, if those three things occur, then we go back to session, ask session to, um, call a congregational meeting and that's when we share with the congregation, the prospective candidate. And then the congregation has to vote um, on that to accept this person and to accept their contract. Um, and away we go. So that I, I, so what would you like to know, Chris? Thank you, you covered a lot of ground for us already. Um, you know, I like to hear a little bit of the personal side. I thought you and Aaron might just tell us how you came to St. Andrew, what excites you about St. Andrew and how that helps you, 50 candidates, all these interviews, how do you sort out which um, resumes to put at the top? 
Well, I, I can answer some of those. I started coming to St. Andrew, uh, oh gosh, in 2006 or 2007. I've been a member since not long after we started coming. Um, I've been involved in various things, including stewardship team for quite a while. A while ago, I was on session for six years. Um, I spend a lot of my time in uh, the music ministry. I play the trumpet. Um, I've been on a previous PNC, so I have a little experience in how that uh, this process works. And I guess what I um, what I look for in a candidate is <laughs> my apologies for that. Uh, uh, someone just needed. came to our door and my dogs are going crazy. Um, uh, what, what I, I'll let Becca um, take over for a second. I apologize. Um, We're looking for a pastor who has a good sense of humor, right, Becca? <laughs> yes. Oh, we um, went to the missional planning um, documents and really looked at them when we were uh, talking about the qualities we're looking for in a ne next pastor. Uh, one of the tasks that you're supposed to do when you're filling out this um, form for the presbytery is what are the qualities, you know, and their, their qualities like um, spiritual maturity and uh, leadership and teacher and um, good communicator and um, we really wanted someone who was forward thinking, who was a strong, um, who could give a strong sermon, uh, but could um, lead by example and, and have a, some kind of um, a sense of self in their spiritual maturity. Um, and we just we're just hoping for the best candidate. That's our goal. Sorry, <laughs> I, I would concur with Becca on on that. I and I, I didn't hear the first part of what she said. Um, for me, it's someone strong leadership qualities, someone who's a collaborative leader. Um, you know, has strong preaching skills and is a good communicator. Um, you know, I think Donnie was good at getting to know people in the congregation. And I think that's really helpful and important aspect of things. And, and yes, as Becca said, we're, we're looking for the best person um, to meet the needs of St. Andrew. Okay, now is... We just have a few more minutes. I, for sure, we're not going more than an hour, and I was going to go 50 minutes. I'm going to tell Cecilia to unmute herself. She's um, the coordinator of the MOS team. She's going to say anything that's on her heart, and then uh, there'll be just a few more minutes. If you have something in the chat or you want to say something publicly, then get ready. Hi, everyone. On behalf of MOS, thank you for your continued generosity um, because um, some of the money that you give to the general fund is given to MOS to determine how to uh, distribute. Chris had come up with four questions uh, for us to answer. Um, and I had delegated a couple other members of MOS to do that. So I am going to ask Paul Hyder now to um, unmute and give a, I guess we're going to be very brief here, um, answer about how our work has been affected by the pandemic. So Paul. Hi everyone. I'd like to recap on uh, one of my first conversations with uh, Pastor Donnie. It was about um, the size of our worshiping congregation. His response to my concerns were, I'm much less concerned about the people who come in here as those who go out in service. And that certainly underscores the philosophy of the mission outreach and service uh, team. We have been, as Cecilia has noted, um, 
trying to address some of the emergencies locally and globally imposed by the uh, um, COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, there have been uh, special needs which have been responded to very generously by the congregation, for instance, uh, by the John Etry family and uh, their outreach in Lebanon. Uh, we have had uh, mission partners who have been on leave uh, here in the United States, such as the Roberts with the um, Wycliffe Bible Translators in Papua New Guinea, who are now locked out of New Guinea in terms of returning. Uh, likewise, uh, in terms of the even Fry family uh, being in Idaho, spending a year there, uh, discerning their future um, uh, service in Kosovo. Locally, however, it's been mentioned uh, earlier in our session that uh, St. Andrew has been able to generously undergird both with participants and with financial resources, the efforts of Presbytery in mission to those in great need in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And perhaps those are just a, a few of the examples of how, yes, we are sending out and reaching out, if not in person, at least with our prayers, which continue to be uh, undergirded so strongly by our prayer ministry with our thanks. Thanks, Paul. And then Jan Taylor is going to talk a little bit more about um, what the MOS team I think is most proud of this year um, is becoming a Matthew 25 church um, as a way to become part of the overall PCUSA um, works and mission projects. So Jan? I'll just put up a couple of informational flyers. Because we haven't been meeting in person, we haven't been sending those out through the mail. However, even with the pandemic, MOS didn't stop taking on new projects. We continue our longtime support of missionaries, but PCUSA had asked churches to take on a new challenge. And they said, pick one of the following, excuse me, pick one of the following, building congregational vitality, dismantling structural racism or eradicating systemic poverty. All very important. We decided that we're already doing some of those things and it would be pretty easy for us to become a Matthew 25 church and let PCUSA and other churches know what we're actively doing. So we picked building congregational vitality. Oh, by the way, uh, Matthew 25 in the chapter of Matthew 25 ends with the familiar lines. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me, etc. And um, then the Lord is asked, when did I clothe you, feed you, visit you in prison? And um, the Lord answers, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. And so we have, um, since spring, I think it was maybe May when MOS decided, yes, we would uh, become a Matthew 25 church and send PCUSA information about uh, our attempts to revitalize or, rev or vitalize our community. Uh, we sent in an article and pictures that were uh, very uh, uh, interesting and showed what uh, fruitful accomplishments we were having with LFL with our feed, uh, feed other, let us feed others. And so that was the first article sent in. And then we sent a second article in uh, about the help we were doing with the derecho up in Cedar Rapids. And after today's service, I'm thinking, oh, we should send an article on how we do music when you're under isolation and distancing, because we have done some innovative things that, again, revitalize and keep us in, in touch with our congregation. So just to let you know, we, along with a lot of other churches in Iowa and nationwide, are a Matthew 25 church. Thanks. Okay, and then to conclude, I'm gonna just roll the last couple questions together. Um, they were, what has surprised you most um, about this year and what is your hope for the future? Well, by this point, you know, nothing is gonna surprise me about 2020, but what impressed me um, was the 
flexibility and adaptability of so many of our mission partners who were affected by this, um, what the uh, groups in Guatemala and Pakistan did to be able to provide, continue to provide the services that they provide um, to uh, the people there despite uh, quarantine uh, and other challenges, uh, the amazing flexibility of our local partners, such as the Community Food Bank, Table to Table, um, as they worked with having fewer volunteers, having to maintain things safely. Um, I, I just was very impressed uh, with all that they have done. And our hope for the future is certainly that soon we can be back to meeting in person, hearing about all these wonderful activities uh, during worship, and that we will have the opportunities to be able to hear about new projects uh, that uh, need our financial prayer and volunteer support. So thank you everyone so much for what you've already contributed in these ways uh, to MOS and hopefully 2021 will be an even better year. <laughs> it's truly a privilege to worship and serve with all of you. And uh, those of you who spent this hour with us, um, you know, your contributions are great. Thank you so much. I, I don't have a way to finish, so perhaps we'll just pass the piece again. If you um, want to watch again, we will be posting this online. If anyone missed it, then uh, we'll take your questions by email and you can watch it again online. And we look forward to seeing you in Zoom and um, in worship um, in the coming year. Good afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye.